up to 1 p.m. in Switzerland and uh, 8, p 8 a.m. Sorry, in the U.S. And a warm welcome to all the participants who are joining us on this panel. Um, I'm just going to We'll be hearing more about that from one of our panelists and also significant investments. But this pandemic has also disrupted livelihoods and had a really big impact on many businesses. But the advances in healthcare can transform life as we know it. And as Frank Richter stated in his recent article, science is the common denominator, denominator that really continues to extend better quality of life to people globally. But this requires more than just technology. And ladies and gentlemen, our panel of highly distinguished experts come from five different countries, actually. Um, actually, six including my own country, Switzerland. And we will actually explore two key questions and other related issues. Firstly, have we approved any good practices to reduce virus transmission rates while also maintaining economic progress and awaiting for this vaccine? And secondly, what is the long-term prospect to alleviate stress and to regain trust? And we'll be drawing on the context that our speakers um, bring us, that our experts bring us in this panel discussion. Um, here are our experts. I'm not sure whether I should go from right to left or from east to west, but I think I'll start with east. Um, uh, Ms. Etty Livney is a lawyer. She's on my type, top right. Maybe Etty, you can give us a little wave. Um, yeah, she is a lawyer from Tel Aviv in Israel and was a former member of Israel's parliament between 2003 and 2006. So a very um, strong experience there in Israeli government. And as well as serving on a number of boards, she's a board member of a number of board companies, Etty has been championing, championing peace in the Middle East uh, for many years. And she is a member of the steering committee, Women Wage Peace, WWP for short. And they've really gained international recognition um, because they've really sprung up throughout the globe. And maybe we'll hear a bit, a bit more about that. So Etty from Israel. I'm going to now move further, slightly further west to Greece. Dimos, Dimosenas Maginas is the managing partner. Could you give us a wave, Dimos? Um, he's the managing partner of Maginas and Partners, which is a law firm not only based in Athens, but also in Luxembourg. And he specializes in the formation of corporate structures, due diligence, also anti-money laundering investigations, compliance checks, and brand protection. So a whole wealth of experience in that area. He also has extensive expertise in providing services to intellectual property rights, information technology and telecom uh, law, commercial law, and he is a shareholder, a member of the board of directors of several defense, aerospace, and energy companies. So Dimos from Greece. Moving slightly further west, um, it's now a gentleman in the blue jumper on my left, or Dimos is left. Mr. Thomas Wu is the co-founder and partner at DGNI Med which is a global technology leader in COVID-19 rapid testing. And there all are all some very important news that Thomas will share with us that's related to the American context later. Um, they've developed um, a rapid test with unmatched accuracy, which um, goes beyond 98% and is achievable within 10 minutes. So Thomas, Mr. Thomas Wu from Germany um, will contribute in that area as well. Now we're moving slightly further west to Spain. Dr. Cecilia Kindelan was the blue background. Thank you. 
Dr. Cecilia. She is a corporate communications professor at the University of Barcelona in Spain, and her specialization is strategic advice, uh, networking, as well as executive trainings on communication techniques and PR strategies. She's also an academician of the Royal European Academy of Doctors, and she previously served as the Vice Principal of the Spanish Association of Directors and as Associate Director of IESE, the business school, which is very famous. Also here we know about it in Switzerland. And she's passionate about teaching and interacting with her students. And finally, um, our final expert on this panel is Ms. Maria Fernanda Levis Peralta. She's the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of Impactivo in the USA. Yeah. And it's an impact, this Impactivo is a very interesting organization, a company which is impact driven a health consulting firm. Um, and Maria has designed and implemented methodologies for the effective implementation of, of evidence-based practices, which is very, very relevant to this discussion. And she's been the principal investigator, as well as a project lead under awards for the National Science Foundation, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And she's very active at the moment in Puerto Rico. Finally, my name is Peter Perrett. I'm a professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland. This is our logo here. And I'm starting this discussion now going back to Israel, the furthest east of all of our panelists. Maybe before we go over to um, Ms. Eti, Eti uh, Livni, can I just invite the participants, if they have any comments or questions, please do contribute by asking your questions in the comments and we'll try and integrate you towards the end of this discussion. So that's very, very important that you also feel that you can participate as well. So we're gonna start in Israel and Eti, um, we've recently heard, and you were just mentioning this um, when we just met at the start, that the Israel has been extremely successful with its vaccine program. Um, in fact, um, I think it was known in The Economist recent, recently as having the fastest vaccine program in the world. Um, maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit about your own context in Israel. I understand that there are very good practices going on. Maybe you could expand a bit more on those and how Israel has managed to really reduce virus transmission rates while still keeping going with economic pro progress. Eti, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. And uh, I'm delighted to be in this panel and uh, dealing with these issues. And I hope there is a lot of people listening to us because uh, I think it's a very interesting panel and issues. Well, uh, about Israel. Israel uh, is, has two sides in uh, fighting the COVID-19. In the first place, it wasn't successful at all. And uh, till now, we have more than 6,000 dead from corona, from virus uh, corona-19, which is a very high number to such a, let's say, successful place. And uh, we had a long lockdown, and uh, students or pupils, among them my grandson, didn't go to school for almost the whole uh, eight or nine months. He is 15, and this age, between 12 and 16, didn't attend school at all, all this period, which is really a, a, really a very bad uh, phenomenon. On the other hand, once there, were, there was the, the vaccination, our prime minister, and it was really his initiative, was very successful at buying and ordering millions of millions of portions of vaccination and paying a lot of money to Pfizer, especially Pfizer. And uh, it, we were the first to import the vaccination, to get the vaccination very rapidly from the moment it was ready. 
and we started to vaccinate the population. We are a country that is a kind of a medium size or small size, let's say we have nine million people. And this kind, this, this measure enables the companies to check upon us the, the experience of vaccination. It's not too big and not too small. And we have a very good health system, very good one. And uh, immediately from the day it arrived, the vaccination, uh, we started vaccinating the population by the ages. First, the, the older one, the, the older one, and then the less. And then everyone that wanted could be vaccinated. And it was very efficient because everywhere, in every town and city, there were places run by the healthcare uh, to vaccinate people from 6 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock at night, one by one. And also the second vaccination, the second portion, was very efficient. After three weeks, we got the, th uh, the second portion. And the results are amazing because uh, we have a very little numbers of new uh, of new um, new people that were uh, affected no almost no more this and uh, well we are on the good uh, path and we opened everything and the lockdown is over we have a percentage of uh, our population that didn't get the vaccination from because of the will. Some of them are ultra orthodox. Some of them are a part of the Arab, Israeli Arab population that are reluctant to get vaccination. They had, they they must be pushed to go to go and get it. They 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 don't have the trust in the authorities. So we would say that 60% of the population is vaccinated fully, and the, and the other amongst them, children and so on, is not uh, is not yet vaccinated. But the results are phenomenal, uh, and this was a one good decision taken by our, by our prime minister to buy from the first first step all the vaccination needed. And now we even giving them to the Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority and other places too. So this is uh, our experience and we, uh, we are very proud of it. We are not proud of, of uh, the period before. And uh, just to add that we have in uh, five days, we have elections. Unfortunately, it's the fourth, the, the fifth time, the, the fourth time in the last two years, and this is the main issue of the elections. And our prime minister, that uh, let's say a great percentage of the population dislike him for all kinds of reasons, uh, is going with this uh, success of the vaccination, and he might win. Uh, because of this uh, cause. Thank you. Thank you, Etty. So that's a very Im interesting start from Israel, um, the fastest vaccination program in the world, and they sound as though they're getting back to normal life, as mm -hmm. Etty mm -hmm. highlighted. The question I'm going to now move over to Thomas. He's involved in a rapid testing company. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I mean, we've heard about vaccines is that really the answer then? We got the vaccine or a few vaccines. Is that really it, Thomas? Or how are things, what's your context like in Germany? And is there really still a need for other things like the rapid testing that you're involved in? I do understand you've got some also important news to maybe share with us that yeah. does um, relate to the US. So let's maybe hear about Germany and what you're doing. I think Germany is a very good example how it looks in the rest of the world. I mean, we admire the efforts in uh, Israel and uh, we're almost jealous, you know, how, how they managed it to vaccinate the population at that speed, yeah, similar to Great Britain and, and partially also in the U.S. Uh, but reality is in the rest of the world, uh, 
uh, we have not access to enough uh, uh, vaccines. Yeah, this is reality. We cannot run our programs like we wish to run them. And I think the other reality is that we have constant uh, uh, mutations of the virus. Yeah, uh, I work uh, also next to uh, in, in the US and in Europe. We work extensively in Asia and in Africa. And I already warned uh, last summer that the African mutations are so aggressive and mutate so fast that it is a, a danger for all current vaccines. Yeah, that they will not cover the new mutations. So I think at the end of the day, uh, the world will live with Corona. It will uh, um, uh, develop, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, to to become uh, more aggressively, possibly not covered by all the vaccines. And as you rightfully said, uh, about forty to fifty percent of the global population is even resistant to to the uh, vaccination. So therefore, I think uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we will have to focus on uh, our uh, hygiene approach that everybody keeps a distance, you know, stays hygiene and extensive testing. I mean, in Germany, we see now that uh, the German government allowed uh, even big supermarket chains, you know, to sell self-testing. Yeah, so uh, I think this will be eventually uh, of high importance also in the future, not only for the people who have no vaccination, but also the people who received vaccination. They need to be tested in three months, in six months, in nine months, if the immunity is actually still existing. Nobody knows. Yeah. So I think uh, testing will remain with us. Uh, it will be an, an important part. And also uh, the next step is that, you know, the people will live more and more with digital passports where they can show they have been tested or they have been vaccinated in order to enter public areas or, you know, starting from movies to airplanes. Yeah. So I think uh, this is another tech development we will see globally that um, you know only people who are tested or vaccinated have actually access to a life which we have seen before COVID-19. Um, I think uh, this will. That's why the, the pandemic I think will stay for us with years. Uh, just because of the capacity of vaccination, because of the mutations, and uh, the wish of the people, you know, to get back to a normal life. So we will have hygiene, we ha will have testing. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we see a shortage everywhere in the world because of this huge demand. And uh, that's why, as you rightfully said, that, you know, we are investing on the one hand side in the testing ca uh, capacity, but we are investing also more and more in people production. So we um, just decided actually this week you know, to invest to a large PPE plant in the US, where we are planning to invest $880 million into uh, uh, examination glove production in the US. And we will uh, additionally invest uh, roughly uh, $60 million in uh, Africa in order to produce a raw material for the gloves. So we have really a global supply chain where we take, um, you know, the raw material, uh, we process the raw material in Africa, and then the finished raw material we will then export uh, to uh, the States and to Europe where we build our second large, uh, second large plant for glove production. Yeah. So we really have then a global network of our factories in Asia, uh, factory in the US, and factory in Europe, to supply basically the major markets with examination gloves, which also will be a, a constant product in our daily life in the future. Thank you very much indeed, Thomas. And I think uh, that also uh, re illustrates quite clearly that it's not just about vaccines. There are many things going on. And one thing that you did mention, Thomas, was this aspect of behavior. And I think uh, too late. I'm going to move to Spain now. And I think, um, Behavior is very much a focus of uh, Dr. Cecilia, Professor Cecilia here, um, who's a corporate communications professor in Barcelona. 
And you, of course, are, are very much involved with different things like this. Your, um, your context in, in Barcelona and your experience as a communications professor are also very relevant here. So what about technology here, um, Cecilia? Can you really tell us how technology can help to reduce transmission rates? Um, we're also bearing in mind that we're trying to keep economic progress going at the same time. Any comments from your context and based on your experience in Barcelona, Spain? Yes, uh, thank you, Peter, for sure. If you uh, allow me, I would like to focus on education. And I would like to share an initiative that I'm involved uh, as a member of the Royal uh, European Academy uh, of Doctors. So, as you know, the pandemic causes uh, by COVID-19 has revealed various strengths and weakness of international education and communica communication system. As you know, more than 40% of the world population has been forced to confine themselves in their homes for a long-term period. And one of the consequences of this crisis has been the significant use of internet as a means of communication by increasing the video conferencing tools. And there is a field where this revolution has been absolutely, and that is the field of education, where millions of children, teenagers, and young university people has been applied overnight to use these tools as the only way to keep in touch with the educational environment to which they belong. So we realize that this inequality in internet access to is, is really very serious and it has nearly generated a different work, even more separate than they already were. And this is caused by the digital fracture. And there is a um, really serious situation. Imagine that um, digital fracture and cognitive fracture. This is very serious and it's an issue I'm very, very worried about it. So um, we have created a manifesto in which uh, we propose five main points to solve this situation. So we explain the situation and after we focus on five points that are the following ones. So we ask to the government, uh, so they have to adopt uh, a specific regu regulatory measures. After we ask companies, these companies that are providing mobile telephones and data service in the world, they have to create a specific instrument to provide universal and free access to internet to all those who cannot afford it. And after that, we would like that manufacturing companies around the world form a fund managed by an international philanthropic institution in which hardware and software equipment is transferred. And on the other side, in the institutional side, ask to the European Union to place internet access as the preferred destination for the digital agenda funds. And we ask the United Nations and all its agency to declare internet access as a universal right. So for us, for me, this is the more, more important things. All people, all population of all parts of the world has to have digital access. Because if not, we are going to go to a cognitive fracture. And this is really very dangerous. So that's my idea. So that's a very, very important message. And um, Maria, who's the CEO of Impactivo, has also been very much involved in a very much related theme, one of tele telehealth. And of course, um, you're also dealing, Maria, in contexts where people do not have ready access to the internet, as Cecilia described. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what your company's doing. And what I found fascinating is your methodology, how you're really involving different stakeholders. Maybe you could just expand a bit on that um, and share, us, share with us. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Peter. And first of all, I'd like to thank Harassus for holding the event and Entrepreneurs Organization for inviting me. Um, so uh, as I was hearing a Cecilia 
there are a lot of technical barriers mm-hmm. to the implementation of telehealth. I'm actually going to focus on the people aspects because technology is not enough. Mm-hmm. Technology is the tool, um, but more needs to be done. And uh, in Puerto Rico, we have gone through a Zika epidemic, two Category 5 hurricanes, a thousand earthquakes, and this has been in the last five years. So by default, we have become public health expert, public health emergency experts. And the first thing that we always do, and the first thing we did for the pandemic, was use our methodologies for identifying what is happening out on the streets, right? And when I say what's happening out on the streets, we literally uh, interview and do surveys with patients. And not just with patients, but with who they trust the most, which is something that we evaluate. And in the context of Puerto Rico, that's their medical providers. So we have both of these sets of data. And what we found is quite interesting. Um, First, there is a lot of resistance on the provider side to implement the technology because they are concerned about the uptake on the part of the patients. Mm. On the part of the patients, there is immense interest. And we looked at uh, total population. We looked at low-income population. We looked at elderly population. And what we found is that even in the elderly population, more than 88% of the population want telehealth or want tools to communicate virtually with their medical team. Mm -hmm. So the interest is huge. How do we get to them? And that's where we have to think creatively. One issue, and it's going to take time, is the the issue of access to broadband, of course. Mm -hmm. But there are workarounds. There are workarounds around the use of the telephone, which most people have. There are workarounds around deploying health professionals to communities in mobile units or even to people's homes when they are chronically ill. And a lot of what we have been doing has been focusing around how do you use technology to understand what's happening with patients at a very individual level and then deploying the appropriate workflows to address those needs. Um, One of the issues that I know uh, that Peter is going to be bringing up is the issue of trust, right? So one of the things that we ask is um, when we do these assessments, we really look at quite a bit. Um, we don't just look at what people's needs are. We look at who they trust. We look at what their social needs are. Uh, and we also look at what resources they have. And that's the basis for innovation, right? That's the mm-hmm. basis for the solutions that we, that we propose. Cool. Um, And I just want to bring up one more thing because I think it's very important. In the context of the economic uh, discussion, I think we leave out the role of health and the health sector and health spending on the economy. It's a big part of GDP spend in all countries. Um, And in the United States alone, which is the country and the framework that I work, I know that 90% of the $3.3 trillion annual spend goes to working with patients that have mental illness and chronic disease which are issues that have been out of the conversation most of the time uh, as we have been focusing on the pandemic. So this is a, a, an important conversation which still needs to be had. Thank you, Maria. And I think um, Cecilia will pick up on a few points later that mm-hmm. she can expand on in her context. I just want to now move back to Israel. And I think that the whole question of trust is the real thrust of this um, this uh, conference in a way. And you mentioned trust there, Maria. Etty, you, you, you mentioned the, the fact that uh, Israel is, um, is currently approaching an election. How does that trust, what does that trust feel like in Israel now? Is that, um, is that trust really there? There is it, is it moving forward in a very positive way? Could you maybe comment on, on how an, an election in parallel to, to a pandemic and how it's, being dealt with. Can you comment on how that's actually increased trust? Increased or decreased trust? Uh, Trust is very problematic here because uh, there is portions of the population that have trust in the whole government and the way it uh, behaves. And the other half or something is distrustful in a way that is unbelievable. There are demonstrations every week 
in front of the, the residence of the Prime Minister in Jerusalem, in Balfour, we call it. There are thousands of people coming to demonstrate and they demonstrate against um, the way this family is behaving and the way that they are using all the, the sources of Israel uh, for their own benefit and against corruption and all that. All this. There is a lot, the, the issue of fake news these days is very, very uh, uh, high, uh, high uh, on the uh, agenda. And there is not much trust because everything is used to, to achieve, uh, uh, to achieve the, the victory in the elections. So uh, it's also the media is some of it became uh, something to be suspected all the time because they are serving the, uh, the government, the current government. It's not even the government, it's the prime minister. And um, on the other hand, this success that I mentioned before of the vaccination, which you, you cannot deny it. So uh, let's say uh, this part of the population that are very suspicious of uh, this government, the right-wing uh, government, is, is, is admitting, well, okay, we did very well in the vaccinations and the prime minister was very successful, but all the other things are uh, not acceptable. And uh, we are facing a lot of issues of corruption and uh, people are very much aware that uh, this issue is uh, very important and can destroy the, the whole uh, structure of this democracy, this young democracy. So uh, there is a, the issue of distrust, and, uh, which is fake news is part of it, and uh, unreliable media is a part of it is uh, one of the issues that uh, the Israelis are confronting now, much more than it was before. Thank you, Etty. And um, I was going to go to Greece, but um, let's move over to Germany with Thomas. And um, it's no um, uh, secret, of course, it's, it's clear that in Thomas, in Germany, in Thomas's country, you have a female leader who's well known um, uh, is there a sort of a, a gender element here? We, we know in Israel it's very male dominated, the whole thing. How do you see uh, leadership here, Thomas, and, and how is that sort of um, influence in trust in your, in your context? Well, I think uh, when it comes to Angela Merkel, everybody knows, uh, particularly in Germany, it is basically her last months of her career. Yeah, so she really rules the country now uh, the way she believed it is right. You know, we never seen such an emotional chancellor the last 15 years, you know, and uh, I think uh, this is quite fascinating to see her, how emotional she's running the country, uh, how strict she is in her measurements. You know, and uh, you can feel, you know, she she has no worry to be reelected uh, because it is literally, you know, the, the past, uh, it's the last months of her total political career. She will stop in mm -hmm. September. So that's why she does everything according to her best content and, 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 and wisdom. And uh, people respect that very much. Yeah, unfortunately, in the rest of the government, uh, at the moment, we, we have some disruptions. We, the Germans were very happy with the government until a few months ago, but with the current uh, vaccine campaign and the inability of the government to get enough vaccines, even though most of them are produced in Germany, but we have no access to them. Yeah, this is very frustrating for the overall population. I think the other thing what um, we see as a global manufacturer uh, what is, and, and I come back to my, uh, to, to our previous speaker. One thing which is really, um, um, irritate or which is really making the crisis even harder. And I'm also, you know, in the COVID-19 task force of the African Union is are all the criminal activities and fakes going on in the worldwide market. 
yeah, which also give a lot of mistrust to the general population. Uh, and uh, when I see on the African continent where we fight every day against fake products and insufficient products uh, delivered to Africa, I mean, it starts from the gloves, it starts from the masks, you know, masks where... Uh, we have strict quality uh, controls in Europe, uh, which have, let's say, a filtration of 95, 98%. The, uh, you know, in, in when we tested uh, uh, masks, you know, offered on the African market, you have a filtration rate sometimes only of 25% because the manufacturer left out the filter in the mask. Yeah, uh, and taking advantage of the African situation that we just have to get anything what is basically left on the world market, you know. So I think this... Um, this decrease on uh, ethics in the industry, and which is, you know, caused by the huge demand of the West, is a huge problem for the developing world, uh, that they cannot trust anymore any product. Yeah. And uh, I think this is also something that influences the overall industry, you know, that uh, there's a lot of mistrust which we are facing also as manufacturer. Now, for example, American companies, they don't order from us unless they bring the product into the U.S. and an independent U.S. entity is testing the product and then they are willing to buy our product. They don't even trust us to bring the product from Asia to the U.S. Yeah? So this mistrust in global trade is also a major challenge for everybody. Thank you, Thomas. And I think that would bring... Demos in here, he's an intellectual property lawyer. I'm not quite sure whether we've got the quality to uh, ask you that question, Demos. Can you hear us? Yes, no, I, I can. Think so. Thank you. Oh, you can. Um, so we just yes, had a comment yes, from can. Thomas about the challenges of um, trust concerning uh, things like intellectual property. How, how is that um, dealt with by your business and how are things moving forward in, in your context. Yeah. You know, for, for the several uh, 10 years or more, uh, we have seen that uh, countries uh, under development or almost developed countries have started producing uh, uh, different products that were able to compete let's say, the American or the traditional uh, big uh, companies. And, uh, of course, the, the only weapon that the mature economies had against these uh, nice efforts and very, uh, you know, uh, uh, money and uh, talent-driven efforts was to talk about certificates lack of certification or you don't know from the origin of the product or you don't know how experienced is this uh, factory and so on and so forth. And we have envisaged also too many uh, cases where after back to uh, Far East to find out if there is uh, if there are products that are uh, look alike and in fact, uh, having no intellectual property uh, uh, rights to use these uh, brand names and that the synthesis of the products weren't the good one. But, Peter, if I may say, this is a question of trust and this is a question of IP uh, um, rights in general. And uh, what we are looking now and facing now is the totally opposite, due to the rush of the people to get uh, vaccines and get uh, medicines in hands, they have forgotten all this procedure and have forgotten everything about, you know, the regulations, the IP rights, everything. And this is very, very, you know, uh, funny in the sense that, you know, today we don't know if AstraZeneca is a nice vaccine or a bad one. And uh, this will depend on uh, decision taken by bureaucratic, bureaucratic uh, 
uh, systems that are um, made out from politicians and not from scientists. And uh, there are also too many uh, games that are being played. But in general, these two, uh, this last year, what we are looking for, and this is the distrust uh, we are facing, is that nobody explaining to us why we cannot attend to an Orasis event or why can't I go to a barber shop? We have very small information about what goes on and we cannot see, or, or if you like, we don't have quality information that comes to our hands. And this is one of the biggest challenges of the internet. You know, we are having millions of sources and we don't know which one we can trust. And there is no, no, uh, nothing in our hand to say that in this panel, I speak truth or, or I speak the truth, or if I speak, uh, you know, just blah, blah, because I'm getting paid and sponsored by somebody and, you know, things like that. So the biggest, uh, the biggest paradigm that I can give and contribute to our panel today is coming from ancient Greece. It's almost 2,700 years ago that uh, Aesop uh, wrote the myth of the steep boy, shepherd boy and the wolf. So we had a shepherd boy and a wolf that never appeared till one day when the neighbors fed up of going to a city.